I've gotten a lot of questions over the years about the technical details of how I've set up the dogs in this game. And I've talked about most of these things individually before, either in a devlog post or a Twitter comment or someplace else. But all that stuff is kind of fragmented and I thought it would be useful and hopefully interesting to do a sort of deep dive here into all of this and have it just kind of collected in one place. So as a sort of overview, what I'm going to talk about in this video is first I'm going to go into the soft body physics illusion that I'm using for the body, the head, and the tail of the dogs. Uh, then next I'm going to talk about the tricks that I use to get the physics to behave nicely and to appear weighty and to not flash across the screen and cause all sorts of wild issues. And then finally I'm going to talk about a specific uh, problem that I have created for myself while making this game, which was that the scale was way too big and it's kind of a common problem that a lot of physics games run into, so I thought it would be useful to talk about how I screwed that up and then how I'm fixing it. So Unity doesn't actually support soft body physics by default. It uses PhysX, which is a rigid body physics system. That said, there are ways of faking this effect a bit, and when I first saw these sorts of things, they kind of seemed like magic to me, but they're actually very simple to achieve, and as long as you have access to some 3D modeling program and you have access to Unity, uh, it's very, very straightforward to set up. So first things first, you need to actually create your object in a 3D modeling program. And then you have to rig it however you would like so that it will move in the ways that you want it to move. Uh, but you're not actually going to animate it here. You're just setting up the ranges of motion so that the physics system can animate it later inside of Unity. Once this object is built and imported into Unity, there are a few different strategies you can use to actually get it into your game. But the basic idea is kind of the same for all of them. So traditionally, you would animate the positions and rotations of all of these bones inside of the modeling program that you're using, uh, and they would be controlled by an uh, actual animation file. But here, each bone is effectively going to be mapped to a physics object, and it's going to have its position and rotation controlled by that. One strategy for this is what I do for the dog's body, which is to joint the mesh to an existing collider rigid body structure. So I chose this method in this case because I'd been working with the dog's body for a while before deciding to try out this effect and physics are pretty finicky so I wanted to keep that original body structure as intact as possible. The body itself is just two cubes jointed together and these cubes are what all the physics forces are applied to and where all the collisions are happening but you never really see them in the game because the renderers are hidden. Instead what you see is the skin mesh that I showed you earlier. Each of its bones has a rigid body attached to it with a mass that is effectively zero, and each of those is being jointed to the approximate body cube. As the cubes move around and interact with the world, they drive the positions of the skinned mesh's bones, creating the illusion that the skin mesh is what's actually interacting with everything. There is a downside to this strategy, and that's that I'm creating two extra rigid bodies and two extra joints, which does actually have a performance impact. Um, if I was starting from scratch, I would switch this to the strategy that I use for the heads and for the tails, which is to make it so that the skin mesh itself is the collider rigid body structure. But this method is a bit easier when you have an existing structure that you're trying to preserve, so that's why I chose it for this case. So for the heads and for the tails, I directly add the colliders and the rigid bodies to each of the different bones inside of the skin mesh object. And this is actually kind of necessary in these cases because I have different tail types and I plan to have different face types and they all have different collider structures that they need in order to look correct. And if I just had one single structure that I was mapping each of the meshes to two, it wouldn't actually line up and it wouldn't look good. So I actually had to do things this way in this case, but it is also better in general because I'm not adding extra rigid bodies and extra joints every time I add one of these objects. One thing to watch out for when you attempt anything like this is the parenting structure. In my specific use cases, it's not much of an issue. If you have rigid bodies that are parented to each other and they're also jointed to each other, at least from my experience, it doesn't really cause any issues. I haven't noticed any major performance impact or any erratic behavior or anything like that it seemed to work out just fine. But that said, if you have rigid bodies that are parented to each other and they are not jointed to each other, they're kind of separate entities, then you can run into issues with that and you'll get kind of erratic behavior because they'll be moving each other but also being moved by the physics system and it's it's really not recommended. So just that's just know that that's something that you have to be on the lookout for with a strategy like this. Another thing to know when you're setting something like this up is that you're never going to have perfect collider coverage because this is not actually a soft body physics system, it's a rigid body physics system and you're just kind of mapping these 
primitive collider shapes to a mesh that is going to distort in very non-primitive ways. So basically what you're going to end up with in some situations is a case where the skinned mesh is clipping into something a little bit, but the collider is not hitting it. Uh, or you're going to end up in a situation where the skin mesh is not actually touching something, but the collider is, and so it looks like the skin mesh is floating a little bit above something that you think it should maybe be touching. And this is just kind of normal, and you can minimize it depending on how you set up your colliders, and it's most likely not going to be a big issue if you set everything up correctly, but it's just something to be aware of, and it's just kind of a natural limitation of this sort of strategy. For me, this kind of specifically comes into play as the dog bodies get longer and longer because I'm not additionally splitting them up into more sections, which is certainly a strategy that I could try to go for, but it's kind of a complex thing to just go and base level implement with the way everything else I have set up is set up currently. So it's not something I've explored, but basically as the dog bodies get longer and longer, the two collider structure becomes less and less of a adequate way of kind of rounding out where the collision's supposed to be and clipping becomes more and more likely. And it's not that bad, but it is something that I have to keep in mind as I work on this project. Once you actually get these objects set up, getting them to look nice as they move around is kind of an entirely separate topic. Uh, unfortunately, no two setups are going to be tweaked quite the same. So you're just really going to have to do a lot of experimentation and playing around with values on your own to get them to look how you'd like them to. And the main things that you're really going to want to experiment with are the rigid body masses, the joint limits, and the joint spring values. And personally, I use joint drives a lot as well. I find them pretty helpful, so I would recommend playing around with those a bit too. My other tip here is to get comfortable using configurable joints and use them for everything, regardless of situation. It has come back to bite me so many times where I thought, oh, I could just use a fixed joint here, or I could just use a hinge joint here, and I put it in, and then uh, not much longer after that, it turned out that I actually needed a bit more control than I thought, and I had to delete that joint and completely remake it with a configurable joint in mind, and go change code to reference configurable joints instead of hinge joints or whatever else. And uh, at this point, every single joint inside of the dog is a configurable joint in almost every other place in the game as well. They look very daunting, and I totally understand that. It's kind of the type of thing where you just have to play around with them for a bit, and it takes a bit to get used to. But they aren't actually as bad as they seem. They just have a lot of field surfaced. And that extra control is pretty important if you're doing anything even remotely complex with physics. So that's my advice. It'll take a little bit, but I think it's very much worth it. So the basic setup is kind of only part of the equation here. Physics are really finicky, and there's a lot that goes into making them stable. First of all, once you're dealing with joint chains, it's very possible for things to get into positions that they should not be, and to stay there. So colliders will invariably tunnel into other colliders when you're using a physics system like this, and if you're dealing with decently high forces, uh, that happens more often than it would otherwise. And when it happens, the physics system tries to figure out where to push the tunneling collider so that it is no longer stuck inside of a solid object. In cases like this, the physics system generally tries to prefer the path of least resistance to push the object away. And that works really great sometimes, but it also means that an object can be resolved in an undesirable direction, leading to situations like this where the dog's leg just gets stuck above the body. Joint chain setups kind of invite situations like this because it's possible for two connected elements of the joint chain to be resolved through opposite directions of an object that they tunnel into, and you just need something else to tell them where to go, otherwise they get stuck like this. So to prevent these sorts of things from happening, there's a pretty common technique, which is to use invisible geometry to help nudge tunneling objects in a more desirable direction. In this case, I have these big spheres that are attached to the dog's body, and they're set to only collide with the dog's legs. If a leg ever tunnels into one, which will invariably happen, it will resolve outside of the sphere again, and whenever one of these legs is pushed outside of the sphere, it can't possibly be also colliding with the body, which means it will never get stuck there. And since the sphere is so big, there is also not much of a danger of the different segments getting resolved in incompatible directions. Unfortunately, in an actual game context like mine, it's not quite enough just to have these in place. You'll still run into other issues. So the first thing is that although these spheres are only set to collide with objects on the limb layer, which should just be the dog's legs. 
that also includes the limbs of every other dog in the game. So leaving things like this, dogs would be able to stand on these invisible objects that were attached to other dogs as well, and that would look really bad. So to get around that, I also have to manually ignore collisions between every single dog's limbs and every other dog's limb collision helpers when the dogs are first instantiated. The second issue here is that even though these objects are invisible, they do still affect their owning object's center of mass. Center of mass is normally dynamically calculated by Unity itself based on an object's collider setup. If these collision helpers were taken into account for this, it would push the dog's center of mass to be much higher than it actually should be, resulting in pretty poor balance and weird looking physics. So to get around this, I have to manually set the center of mass in code for each dog when it's created. Uh, this code, basically what it does is it disables all these collision helpers, it grabs the center of mass values that Unity generates at that point, then it re-enables the collision helpers, and then it resets the center of mass values to what they were before these collision helpers were enabled. So all of these values, along with the values that are generated from ignore collision, are actually automatically regenerated for an object every time it's disabled and enabled. So if you do something like this, you have to be sure to run this code every single time an object is disabled and enabled, otherwise you'll lose all these values. Um, in my case, I also manually adjust the body center of mass for the dogs to be a little bit lower than it would normally be calculated to be, and that gives the dogs a little bit better balance and makes them more stable. A few other pieces of info about the physics setup that I have going on. Uh, all the dog rigid bodies in this game are set to use continuous collision detection instead of the default, which is discrete. So this helps prevent them from tunneling through objects. And it does cost more in performance, so that's worth being aware of, but I deal with pretty high forces in this game, so it's necessary to have that on. Otherwise, I'll get stuff like dogs flying entirely through pin walls, which is obviously not really great. And uh, additionally, none of the dogs in this game have drag applied to them, and none of them have angular drag applied to their rigid bodies. And this makes them feel way weightier than they would otherwise. And I understand that in real life, things do actually have drag and angular drag applied to them, but in the context of this video game, it feels much nicer when they don't. Another thing that I do is that I wrote up this custom class that gets applied to all rigid bodies in the game that just stops them from bouncing unnecessarily. So I found while working on this project that uh, with this physics system, at least with all my settings, it is really easy to end up with situations where objects kind of do these little bounces when they collide with high forces and it doesn't feel very realistic because it makes them feel way lighter than they actually should be feeling. Uh, but I've got this thing going on where if an object ever has an upwards y velocity that's less than its mass after colliding with something, then I zero out that y velocity. And that stops it from visibly bouncing. And from all of the just natural testing in this game so far, I've never run into a case where it looks weird, even though it is actually a natural behavior. So it's not completely realistic, but it kind of wraps the physics system a little bit to make it look a little nicer for my use cases. And it's, it's really helped things feel a lot weightier. And the last kind of custom physics thing that I have going on here is I have code that wraps nearly all of my joint chain setups, uh, like the face, the body, the legs, the tails, all of that. And what this code does is it just continuously checks positions of each of the objects in the joint chain and it checks the relative positions from each object to each other object to make sure that nothing ever gets too far away from anything else. And in the case that it does happen, in fixed update, it will hard set the position of the offending object back to its default position. And what this is trying to do is just make sure that nothing ever gets too wild, which tends to happen when you have very large forces. Um, technically, configurable joints at least have a built-in way to do this. It's the projection mode, projection distance, projection angle fields. And what it's supposed to do, as I understand it, is if uh, the joints ever violate their constraints by that amount, they'll be snapped back to where they're supposed to be. But I've never been able to consistently make that field work for me the way I'd like it to. So I've just kind of built my own solution on top of it. Um, it's possible I'm misusing it, but I've, I tried for a decent amount of time and never got it to work. Uh, in any case, my solution seems to work great, and uh, it's especially necessary when you're working with skinned meshes, because when you're working with just separate objects and they get disattached from each other, it's not a huge deal, if as long as they come back, because they're separate objects that are in separate positions, and there's no stretching, there's, they're just in different locations. So you might get like some separation, but that's about it. But in the case that you have a skinned mesh, uh, 
with bones and those bones get too far away from each other, that means that the mesh stretches between the bones. And what will happen, especially when this is happening a lot in sequences, you'll get these big flashes on the screen. You'll get these big flashes of basically stretch geometry and it looks really bad. So the more you're working with skin meshes, the more something like this is sort of necessary, I think. But it's the code for it's actually fairly straightforward and it's a pretty easy thing to implement on your own and it's, uh, it's worth doing, I think, if you run into this problem. The last thing that I want to talk about is the big mistake that I made with this project, which is that I completely screwed up the scale when I started. So it wasn't until I was fairly far along that I actually realized how much of an issue I had created for myself. Uh, to give you an idea of what I mean, the dogs in my game are all technically about eight feet tall uh, when they're on all fours, and this was not done on purpose. This is a complete accident. I didn't realize that I had set things up this way. Uh, and what this means is that they appear much floatier than they actually should appear because you expect them to be, I don't know, like three feet tall, but actually they're eight, so they appear to fall twice as slow as you would expect them to. Um, and this was great for me when I was first implementing them and when I was tuning physics values because floatier physics are easier to stabilize. Um, but it also meant that I was stuck with floaty physics. And every time I tried to make things feel weightier, it didn't quite come together. So reducing the scale of a physics object is very easy if it's simple. Um, but as soon as you have a complex object with lots of forces acting on it through code and joint setups and that sort of thing, it's actually incredibly not straightforward to do that. So it was something that I spent a little bit of time trying to do, but it quickly became clear to me that it was not really realistic for me to fix my problem that way. To get around this, the solution that I came up with is a little roundabout, but it actually works fairly well. Basically what I did is I have the world's gravity running at three times the normal scale, and dogs themselves selectively get upwards forces applied to them to cancel out this additional gravity while they do certain actions such as walking or attempting to stand up. So basically that means that when they're tumbling around, they look like they're the weight they're supposed to be, but when they're doing something like walking, uh, or standing up, they're using effectively the same physics that they were using when I first implemented them. And that's, it's not one-to-one, -one. There, there are differences still, but it's close enough that they still work correctly and I was able to tune around it, which was something that I didn't feel I would be able to do if I had to completely uh, change their scale and start from scratch with that. So uh, there's some semi-complex logic that controls all this. It's not the most efficient way of solving a problem like this. And it's a problem that I really shouldn't have had to begin with. I was like, I don't know, probably about a year into the project when I realized how badly I had scaled everything. So uh, basically I would just like to say, check your scale whenever you do a physics project like this. That should be the first thing that you do is make sure that your scale is correct because a unity cube is actually a little bit more than three feet tall, which is not obvious. At least it wasn't to me when I was first starting. And a uh, three foot tall cube falls visibly much different than a like half a foot tall cube does. So check your scale and don't make the same mistakes that I did. So hopefully this felt like a decent overview of how the dogs are technically set up and how their physics are basically structured. But if there's anything that it seems like I glossed over or if there's anything that you'd like to know more about or if there's anything that it did not seem like I explained very well, uh, just let me know and I will consider either making another video or I could maybe respond directly in the comments if it's something that's simple enough. But I was trying to kind of skirt the line between being overly technical and overly simplistic in this video. So hopefully I succeeded there, but please let me know if I did not <laughs> and then I'll take that into account for the future. Uh, but yeah, so I, I think that's it for now um, and I hope this was interesting and I hope it was useful for anybody trying to do something kind of similar. And I hope you enjoyed.